Back in 1982, German automaker BMW released the second generation of its popular 3 Series, designated the E30. Replacing the first gen E21, the E30 reached the United States in 1983 and would improve upon its predecessor in almost every way, with sharper looks, improved engines, and a wider range of body styles. But it was the introduction of the M3, a car initially developed for racing, that would soon become the standard by which all other sport coupes would be judged. This is the story of the second generation of the BMW 3 Series, best known by its fans as simply the E30. This is my old car. The BMW 325i convertible, the ultimate panning machine. This is the second My Old Car episode which focuses on an older generation of a model whose nameplate is still in use today. My original plan with this channel was to only feature models that are no longer in production. But that eliminated cars that have a lot of interesting history, so I now am considering specific generations for long running models. This time around I wanted to choose a make that I hadn't featured yet. Can you just take it all off? And one that can't be mistaken for anything but classic 80s design. No, no, because otherwise you could have stolen the car by just taking the alarm off. I mean, they weren't that stupid in the 80s. That led me to consider the E30, which when it arrived in the US in 1983, it wasn't an immediate hit, but it wasn't long before the E30 became the car for the yuppies of that decade to be seen in. Although the E30 version of the 3 Series is the one I remember the most growing up in the 80s, it wasn't the first 3 Series to be sold in the US. The first generation E21 entered production in 1975 and exports reached the US in 1977. And for those Americans who didn't know BMWs that well, they probably didn't question why the car's bumpers were so large, as all cars in the US were similar. But a German visiting the US would likely have been appalled by it. Those huge bumpers, which were often referred to as diving boards, were required as per US government regulations on all cars sold in the US but they tended to look a lot worse on imports that weren't designed with big bumpers in mind. Despite the big bumpers, when it came to American competitors for a German compact luxury car, there really wasn't any in the 80s. American luxury back then was dominated by Cadillac and Lincoln, and the gas crisis of the early 70s resulted in downsized models like the controversially styled Seville arriving by 1980, but they weren't nearly as small or as fun to drive as the 3 Series. Cadillac dealers were begging for a smaller and more fuel efficient car to compete with BMW which led to Cadillac rushing the Cimarron to market in 1982. So yes, you heard me right. Cadillac expected the Cimarron, a rebadged Chevy Cavalier, to compete with the BMW 3 Series. Although the US spec E21, the 318i, had a 1.8 liter four-cylinder that could produce 101 horsepower in 1981, the lowly Cimarron could only produce 88 horsepower. Is it possible that a potential 3 Series buyer cross-shopped a Cimarron? Yeah, no. When the second gen 3 Series, the E30, reached US shores in 1983, the overall shape had squared off a bit as compared to the E21, but admittedly still looked similar to the outgoing model, complete with the diving board bumpers. Those that only know BMW's current styling direction may be surprised to see how small the twin kidney grille once was. Although the E21 could be had with either dual or quad headlamps, the latter's popularity led to the E30 having the quad headlamps standard. Like the outgoing E21, the E30 was initially offered only as a coupe or convertible. The latter was designed by coach builder Bauer, which had built many of the convertibles for BMW since the 1930s. Bauer models are often called fixed roof convertibles because they were originally built as coupes. To maintain structural rigidity, only a portion of the roof, along with the rear window, was removed. By 1985, BMW offered their own factory built convertible although the Bauer models were still available for sale as well. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't put the top up. I haven't figured out how to do it yet. The E30 would also offer a four-door model in the U.S. by 1985, which was a long-awaited addition that greatly increased its potential buyers, and BMW even made the four-door have the same wheelbase as the two-door. Also, unlike its American competitors, whose cars tended to have names that were actually, well, names, BMW followed a similar pattern used by its German competitors like Mercedes, Audi, and Porsche as well as French cars such as Peugeot and Citroën by using alphanumeric designations for each model. I must admit that I've always preferred cars that have actual names since it provides, at least to me, a more personal connection to a car. But the alphanumeric naming did have an advantage in that it clearly identified the car's ranking and purpose in the lineup. In the US market, starting in 1983, you had the 318 and the 325 for the four and six cylinder cars respectively. And those numbers were typically followed by one or more letters such as I for fuel injection, S for sport, E for economy, and X for all-wheel drive, the latter being only on the six-cylinder models. There was also the D designation for the six-cylinder diesel, which were never originally imported to the United States. But since these cars are now all over 25 years old, 
making them now legal to import, you may see a diesel in the U.S. today. Inside, the E30 dashboard was unusual as compared to its American counterparts, thanks to the radio and climate controls tilted towards the driver. Although the E30 was still marketed as a luxury-oriented model, manual roll-up windows were still standard, and the door is still quite skinny, but that made the car lighter and helped overcome the relatively weak engines they had early on. The E30 also defied what was becoming a strong trend in the U.S. of the 80s, by keeping most of their cars as rear-wheel drive, with the exception of the all-wheel drive 325iX model. Front-wheel drive was becoming far more common among compact American cars, as they touted its advantage in inclement weather. And yet, somehow Germans in their home country seem to have no problems driving their rear-wheel drive models in the snow. I think that speaks a lot to the skill German drivers seem to inherently have. And yes, this is coming from an American. Let's be honest, everyone else on the road besides you is a moron. Although horsepower ratings in the 80s pale considerably to today, there were still some minimums that U.S. buyers expected considering the BMW's premium price. The cheapest BMW 318i still cost around $18,000 in 1984 which was far more expensive than many American cars with more powerful V6s. As a result of poor sales, imports of the 318i to the U.S. ended by 1986. I am so going to die. And in its place was the 325e and ES six-cylinder models, which were an improvement at 127 horses. All 3 Series BMWs now have the added advantage of a fifth and sixth cylinder. But the real improvement came with the 325i in 1987, which bumped horsepower to 168. In 1988, there was yet another option which most E30 fans know the best, the M3. Originally offered in Europe in 1986 as a homologation to conform to Group A touring car racing rules, the M3 was far more than just a 3 Series with a bigger engine. It is also the winningest touring car in history, one of the winningest race cars in history. Although that engine, the BMW S14 four-cylinder, could produce 195 horsepower, thanks to an increase in displacement to 2.3 liters. Factory pistons are $400 a piece. Lower timing turn rails are $500 a piece. Along with a twin cam and four valves per cylinder. That horsepower rating of almost 200 was nearly double what the first E30s in the US could muster. BMW M3. From the outside, you could easily identify an M3 from a standard E30, thanks to wider front and rear fenders, a flatter rear window, and a large front splitter, all to improve aerodynamics. The M3 also had improved brake calipers and rotors, a top-end Getrog 5-speed manual transmission, and five lug nut wheels, necessary for the then huge 16-inch diameter wheels. However, if you wanted all that performance in a four-door, you were out of luck, as the M3 was only built as a coupe, although a few M3 convertibles were sold in Europe. Although an E30 M3 today can be a valuable commodity, when it was new, the M3 didn't sell nearly as well as a six-cylinder 325i. That's because the 325i's performance was nearly on par with the M3, but easier to live with as a daily driver, which broadened the 325i's appeal. In 1988, the E30 had a refresh that finally shrunk the huge diving board bumpers and offered them as body color. This, along with less chrome trim and redesigned tail lamps, made the newer models, dubbed the E30 Series 2, much more attractive to U.S. buyers. The Series 2 models also offered the first wagon models, although considering the term wagon is typically a U.S. term, the better term maybe would be a state, since it was never sold as new in the U.S. However, in BMW speak, the wagon estate model was known as the touring model. Although wagons are virtually non-existent in the U.S. today, they were still relatively popular in the U.S. in the late 80s, so their exclusion for the U.S. market is surprising, at least to me. The platform of the E30 was also used as the basis for one of BMW's most unusual models, the Z1. Anyone in North America likely has never seen one in person, as it was never sold here when it was introduced in 1989. The Z1 would probably be considered just another roadster if it wasn't for its most bizarre feature, that being its doors, which slid down into the bodywork, as opposed to simply opening outward like almost every other car. That alone may have been enough to prevent exports to the US, as it would simply have been too weird to sell well enough to make it worth the cost of exporting it here. The price point of the Z1 also would have been a deterrent, as it cost more than a BMW 7 Series back then. Only 8,000 were ever produced, although execs at BMW back then have been quoted to say that initial orders were 35,000 at its launch. Maybe that was just a bit too optimistic. However, well before the Z1 ever hit the market, BMW was well into planning the next iteration of the 3 Series. In fact, the year before the E30 hit the market in 1982, and three years before American buyers saw the E30, the next 3 Series, the E36, began development. In October of 1990, the E36 was officially launched in Europe, 
and reached American shores by 1992. The E-30 didn't completely stop production when the E-36 began, as E-30 production lasted until 1994, although only the Turing models lasted that long, as the sedan and coupe models were phased out sooner. So much so that in the U.S., the last E-30s were for 1991. The BMW 318 is back. In the end, over 2.3 million E-30 models were sold worldwide with nearly 350,000 of those being in the U.S. between 1984 and 1991. Prices ranged as low as $16,400 in 1984 to as high as nearly $36,000 in 1991. Today, prices of E30 models in the U.S. can range from under five grand to easily $100,000 or more for well-kept examples. This is because there was such a wide range of E30 models, several of which never were imported to the U.S. when new, but are now eligible as they are now all over 25 years old. The Touring models, aka wagons, and specialty models like the M3 Evo 1 and 2 and Sport Evo, the latter topping out at 235 horsepower, are now obtainable to U.S. buyers, if they can find them. Today's 3 Series, now called the G20 in its 7th generation, is a rare sight in the U.S. as Americans continue to prefer crossovers and SUVs, resulting in BMW's X-Series models selling best here. The G20 platform has spawned several variations, including the 2 and 4 Series models, and the controversial and ultimately cancelled electric i3. BMW's current styling direction has also been polarizing, focusing on huge grills, even on electric cars that don't even need a grill. It makes many BMW purists wish they could return to a much simpler and classic look of the E30 models of the 1980s. Did you just say the word feces, you fecal, said? Fe what what, what uh, certainly appeared to be fecal matter, yes. That's poo, isn't it? That's poo. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. <laughs> If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid 2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time. Oh, you're gonna break my family!